This video is going to go through and review Power Series, and if it looks like there's enough time, I'm also going to go a little further and go into Taylor Series. If not, that'll be a separate video. So what we did towards the end of Chapter 9, after the last quiz, is we talked about what a Power Series was, how we determine where it's centered, how we determine the radius, and then how we determine the interval of convergence. So I have two examples up here, and a lot of times you'll be given questions that will only want one thing. It will just want the radius, or it will just want the interval of convergence, but I want to take you through the full process. So you're you're comfortable looking at these problems and answering any question that they could ever ask in any type of environment. So what we have here, we have power series. Remember what it means a power series is a function of x, whereas all our other series when we were running all those tests were just in terms of n and that index value. We are now working with x's. To determine uh, the radius and the interval of convergence of a power series, we always use a ratio test. Now when you look at this first one up here, we automatically know the center is 0 because we have nothing subtracted from x. So the center is something that should be obvious, and they'll never just ask that, but you use that to answer the rest of the problem. So we're going to start with the ratio test. We got the limit as n goes to infinity. We take the absolute value, which means if there is anything that is negative that is alternating, we do not need to write it. We don't have that here. We're just going to have 3 to the n plus 1 times x to the n plus 1 over 3 to the n times x to the n. Remember the way that the ratio test works is you take the n plus 1 term and divide it by the n term. Simplify it. So for this one, we're going to simplify the 3's. We'll reduce the x's will reduce, and our ratio test says that in order to converge, this has to be less than 1. We want to get the absolute value of x by itself, so we're going to divide by 3. So we have the absolute value of x is less than a third. That tells me that my radius is a third. It also tells me that my interval, since I'm centered at 0, will go from negative a third to positive a third. So I'm going to write that down. Negative a third to positive a third. And the last thing that you have to do is you have to determine the endpoints of your interval if they're part of where it converges or not. So we want to see if our interval includes or doesn't include the endpoints. So I like to check those one at a time, just kind of come off to the side. I know I'm kind of running out of room. Just say, okay, well, what happens if x is negative a third? Looking back at your original series, if x is a negative a third, you have 3 to the n times 1 third to the n because, uh, excuse me, negative one-third to the n. Because they are both to the n power, you are allowed to multiply them together, you get negative one to the n. A series that is negative one to the n, um, it is an alternating series. It is an alternating series where the limit is just one. And with alternating series, if you can say that the limit is zero, meaning the the denominator is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, we say it converges. If it's an alternating series that does not have a limit of zero, we say it diverges by the nth term test. Now, the nice thing with these is you usually don't have to say which test you used. Um, it's more concerned that you used some sort of test and came up with a conclusion. So this is a diverging, which means I am not including the negative one-third, so I'm not going to put the or equal to. Then I'm going to see, well, what happens if x is a third? Well, if x is a third, then I'm going to have 3 to the n times one-third to the n. Multiply the bases, the 3 and the third, we get 1 to the n. This is also a diverging series for actually the same reason. It does, um, it has a limit that is not 0. So by the nth term test again, we say that it diverges. Because if you were look to look at this series, this would just be the series 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, which just keeps getting larger and larger and larger. So my interval of convergence goes from negative one-third to one-third and does not include either endpoint. Uh, you always want to check them. You will run into series where one endpoint is included. It converges by some test and one endpoint doesn't, where both endpoints do, or in this case, where both endpoints do not converge. Next one, uh, same idea, also centered at zero, because you see that you don't have anything subtracted from x. So we start with our ratio test once again. This one's a little more involved with the actual test itself and the simplifying. Uh, with the ratio test, because of the absolute value, we do not have to worry about this alternating piece, so I'm not going to write it down. But we have x to the 2 times parentheses n plus 1 over 2 parentheses n plus 1 factorial times 2n factorial over x to the 2n. When you simplify this, your x power is going to be 2n plus 2. If you have an x to the 2n plus 2 over an x to the 2n, you end up with an x squared. I'm not going to put it in absolute values because I know that's always positive. With my factorial, 2n plus 2 factorial, um, this is going to be 2n plus 2 factorial. When I simplify that, I'm going to end up with a 2n plus 2 on the bottom and a 2n plus 1. 
The limit of that as I take n to infinity, because I only have n's on the bottom, is going to be 0. And 0 is always less than 1. So by my ratio test, we would say that it is always converging. The radius of convergence we write as infinite, because it's, it's a converging in all directions. And we say that the interval of convergence goes from negative to infinity to infinity. These are some of the easier problems. Uh, the most common problems are ones that actually have a finite interval. But you will run into ones that always converge. And that's great, because you don't have any endpoints to check. You'll also run into ones that will never converge. We say that those are divergent, except for at the center. And those are faster, because you don't have to worry about endpoints. The ones that take the most amount of time are like the first one you just saw. The next slide, and I think this wasn't video wasn't too long, so I'm just going to keep going, reviews Taylor series. And I want to go through and talk about how we come up with the Taylor series, how we use a Taylor series to make an approximation, and how we test to see how good that approximation actually is, kind of bound that error is what you hear it referred to a lot. So we're going to start with this first one up here wants us to estimate the cosine of 0.2. We want a fourth degree Taylor polynomial centered at 0, which shouldn't surprise you because I'm looking at 0.2, and I want to look at something really close to the center. And then when we're done, we're going to see how good of an approximation is, look at the error potential. So I'm going to start with cosine. And I need to go out four derivatives. So my first derivative is negative sine. My second derivative is negative cosine. Third derivative is sine. And fourth derivative is cosine. My Taylor polynomial, when I put 0 in, I'm going to use the coefficients. When I put 0 in here, I get 1. When I put 0 in here, I get 0, negative 1, 0, and 1. And as you're doing this, you might say, you know, I know what the Taylor poly polynomial is, Taylor series is for cosine. Do I really need to go through this? The answer is no. The AP is OK with you memorizing the formula and skipping all, showing all the steps. Your series would be, and we call it, a lot of times you'll see this notation, fourth degree polynomial. You don't have to put any notation if you don't want. Would equal 1 minus x to the second over 2 factorial plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial. What you'll have is this coefficient, this coefficient, times x to that power. So if you're working with a second derivative, you're working with a second power, divided by that number to the factorial. So again, if you're working with a second derivative, you're working with a second power, and you're working with a 2 factorial. So this is the Taylor polynomial that approximates cosine. Next thing you want to do is use it to figure out what is the cosine of point 2. So if I figure out the cosine of point 2, that means I'm going to put a point 2 everywhere I see an x. So it'll be 1, oh, one minus point 2 squared over 2 factorial, which is just 2, plus 0.2 factorial to the, f or sorry, 0.2 to the fourth over 4 factorial. 4 factorial is just 24. These problems are always on a calculator type of section, uh, unless you had to stop here and they just said, okay, don't worry about plugging in your calculator. Uh, I've already done this, so we'll tell you that the answer is to three decimal places 0.980. If you wanted to use your calculator, you could see how close that actually is to actually find out what really the cosine of 0.2 is. Now to figure out the error. And we talked about error at the very end of the chapter and said there are two ways to determine error when you're looking at Taylor polynomial or series. And the easiest way is if it's an alternating series, which luckily we have. If it's not an alternating series, we have to do a Lagrange error, which can sometimes be a little more involved. When you have an alternating series, your error is can be no more than the first omitted term. So what I mean by that is if you look at what term would come next, so the next term would be x to the 6 over 6 factorial. It would be a negative, although because you're looking at error and error could go in each direction, we don't we ignore the negative. We just take the absolute value of the next term. And when you see what would happen if I put 0.2 into that term, I get 0.2 to the 6 over 6 factorial which ends up being an extremely small number. It's actually, in scientific notation, it's 8.8 .8 times 10 to the negative eighth. So you're looking at an extremely small error, which means the answer 0 0.980 that you got for cosine of 0.2 using the Taylor polynomial can, only, can be off by, at most, 8.8 .8 times 10 to the negative eighth. Extremely small error.
For the next one, now we're looking at a, a Lagrange, or we're looking at a natural log, and we want to center it around zero and find the error bound as well. Now, since we're centering around zero and we want the natural log of 1.3, my function that I'm working with is 1 plus x when you're taking the natural log, because you want to put zero in and be really close to the natural log of one, because we're looking at something that's very close to that value. So that means if that's my first derivative, then or that's my original function, then my first derivative is 1 over 1 plus x, just doing a du over u. And my second derivative, now we think of this as 1 plus x to the negative 1 power. So when I drive it again, I get negative 1 over 1 plus x to the second. And then the third derivative, which is as far as I have to go in this problem, ends up being, oh, I need to put the 2 out here, sorry, ends up being uh, positive 2 over 1 plus x all cubed. I want to see what happens when I put 0 in. That is my center. When I put 0 in, natural log of 1 is 0. So I do not have a constant term. When I put 0 in, 1 over 1 plus 0 is 1. And then I get negative 1. And then my last one is 2. So this gives me the coefficients that go in for my Taylor polynomial. So I do not have a constant term. I'm going to jump to my first degree term. So I get 1 times x over 1 factorial, nothing to do there, and then minus x squared over 2 factorial, or just 2, and then plus 2x to the third over 3 factorial. And that's as far as it wanted. It wanted a third degree Taylor polynomial. So if you want, you could call this p sub 3. You see that notation a lot. And we're going to use that to approximate the natural log of 1.3. So the number that I'm putting in here is not 1.3. I'm putting in the number that's going to make this natural log 1.3, what you're taking. So you need to put in a 0.3, because that's how far off you are from the center. We centered it at 0. We're 0.3 off of that. So we're going to have 0.3 minus 0.3 squared over 2 plus 0.3 cubed over 3. Uh, the reason I have it over 3 is because it would be 2 over 6, so I just reduced it to over 3. Um, I haven't done this yet, so I'm going to go on my calculator and get my answer here. So I've got 0.3 minus 0.3 squared over 2 plus 0.3 cubed over 3. So I get 0.264 as my approximation. And again, you can always check to see, does, is that close to the natural log of 1.3 when you're allowed to use your calculator? Because if you're getting something way off, you can usually catch your mistake and try to go back and fix what you did. And then the last piece to find the error bound, and this is another example of a pretty easy one, and it's very common for the AP test to do that, to give you ones that because it alternates, you don't have to use Lagrange. You can go through and say, well, my error is going to be no more than the first omitted term. So my next term, my next omitted term, would be, if you kind of follow the pattern, it's going to be negative 0.3 to the fourth all over 4. We don't worry about the negative, so we're just going to figure out what this is, and that will give me my error. So when you go to get, again, your calculator, we say, well, what happens when we take 0.3 to the fourth and divide it by 4? We get 0 0.002025. That is how off my approximation could be. That is kind of, they call it like the error bound. That's the maximum error that could occur. A lot of times what they do on an AP test is they'll say, prove that the error is less than point, in this case, maybe they'll say, prove that the error is less than, has to be less than 0 0.003. You say, well, I went through, I used my first admitted term, and I got 0 0.002025, which is definitely less than the error that they asked for. So that's another way that it could be worded on an AP test that I've seen very common. So this video hopefully gives you a little more comfort level as far as being able to do power series, makes you feel a little more comfortable when it comes to writing Taylor series, Taylor polynomials, and understanding error when it comes to polynomials or series that alternate. Alternate.